Hello to you. I do hope you're well. Welcome to this GCSE Religious Studies Revision Session. I'm Ben Wardle and today we are talking about the key Islamic beliefs, teachings and practices that you need to know based on the AQA advanced information for the 2022 exam. So we're going to be talking through, first of all, the key beliefs and teachings and then through the key practices that you need to know for the 2022 exams. Now, of course, this exam takes a very familiar structure, doesn't it? We go through from question one, which is worth one mark, all the way through to question five, which is worth 12 marks. And I think one of the most important things you need to know going into the exam room is the key command words that are going to be used in the questions. I think it's just as important that you know the command words as it is that you know the content because AQA are always going to be looking for the same kind of thing. And this means we can be very confident about securing full marks in our answers because if we know what the question wants us to do, we can do it and we can secure those marks. So what do we need to know? We need to know about the importance and the influence of the key beliefs and teachings we're going to be talking about. So we don't just need to know what the beliefs and teachings are, we need to know why they're important and what impact, what influence they have on Muslims today. So we need to be starting to think about the importance of the teachings that we are talking about. You might also be asked about the performance of certain practices, you might be asked about the reasons why Muslims believe or do a certain thing, you might be asked to explain something, or as you always are asked in question five, to evaluate. So here it is, my top revision tip as we get started, before we even start considering the actual content is this, know the command words of the exam questions. And as we go through the content today, I will be signposting when we're looking at the importance or the influence of a key belief or teaching, just so we can get ourselves into that mindset for exam success. So let's get started, shall we? And we're going to start, as I say, with the key beliefs and teachings. So AQA have told us we are going to be asked about these five key beliefs and teachings. We're going to be asked about the nature of God. We're going to be asked about angels. We're going to be asked about Rissala. So that's communication. And in particular, about prophethood. We're going to be asked about the holy books. So of course, the Quran and the other holy books. And then we're going to be looking at the Imamate. Now, this is not the order the questions will be asked in, but it gives us a very clear idea of the topic we are going to find when we open that paper so we can feel confident we can feel prepared and we can be ready to get that grade eight that grade nine that we deserve now as we go through these key topics you are going to see these blue boxes that I've added I do apologize if you're colorblind by the way <laughs> I am sorry about that. So here are the blue boxes. As you can see, Surah 2, um, 177 is my example I'm giving you here. These blue boxes are going to contain the key scripture, the key quotes from the Quran that underpin the beliefs, teachings and practices that we are talking about. You don't need to memorize them word for word. You don't even need to memorize really the specific verse. But what I'm trying to do is get you into the habit of using evidence in your explanations. So knowing why Muslims believe a certain thing, why Muslims perform a certain practice, looking at the scriptural evidence, looking at the scriptural foundations for everything that we're talking about. So this quote here, for example, from the Quran from Surah 2 says, the truly good are those who believe in God and the last day, in the angels, the scripture and the prophets those who keep up the prayer and pay the prescribed alms. So we've got lots and lots of the topics we're talking about today in that quote. You know, we've got the angels, we've got scripture, we've got the prophets. And remember, they all connect together. There are so many links between the different beliefs, teachings and practices we're talking about. And then we've got there, those who keep up the prayer. And we're talking about prayer later and pay the prescribed alms. So of course, we're talking about zakat there as well. So just look out for those blue boxes, which will signpost and highlight to you the key scripture, the key quotes from the Quran that underpin everything we're talking about. They're a fantastic source of evidence, especially in a question five response. So our first topic, let's get started now, shall we? Now that I've waffled on about exam technique and the specification, let's get started with the nature of God. Really, really important, fundamental, foundational for our understanding of Islam, because in Islam, we have this key, key belief. 
Tawid, the oneness of God, it's monotheism. Now, in pre-Islamic Arabia, people worship different gods, different idols, all of these different belief systems were in place. And what was really unique about Muhammad and what was really unique earlier on when it came to Ibrahim is this idea of monotheism, the oneness of God. So as I've put here, Tawid is the most fundamental belief of Islam and all other principles relate to it. So it really is at the core of Islam. It underpins, as I've put there, all the other key principles. It is part of the six articles of faith in Sunni Islam and the five roots of Usul ad-Din of Shia Islam. It is the central belief contained in the Shahada, the first of the five pillars. So the five pillars, here they are, are the Shahada, the idea there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger. The Salah, of course, prayer, zakat, which is alms giving to those in need. Fourth is Psalm, which is not going to be on this exam. And the fifth is Hajj, which is to do with pilgrimage. We'll talk more about those a little bit later when we're discussing practices. But right now we are focusing on the nature of God. So we need to know Muslims believe the oneness of God is the key teaching of their religion. The Taweed, the oneness of God. We also need to know about omnipotence, the idea that God is all powerful. God is the creator and the controller. We also need to know that God is just. And he is going to judge people fairly. And this links in with the idea of judgment day and life after death. And then God is merciful, that God is forgiving. So our key source of scriptural evidence for this is Surah 112, where we read, he is God, the one God, the eternal. He begot no one, nor was he begotten. No one is comparable to him. Some more key quotes from the Quran for you now. This is from Surah 2. And it says, God rewards good deeds and knows everything. The idea of omniscience, all knowing. He is with you wherever you are. This idea of imminence, that God is with you, that he is alongside you, that he is participating in the world. He is a constant source of support. And here is the idea of God being merciful. Again, from Surah 2, he's described as the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. This idea God is forgiving and compassionate. Surah 9 tells us only what God has decreed will happen to us. He is our master. Let the believers put their trust in God. Key ideas here about predestination and, of course, about omnipotence as well. Talking of omnipotence, Surah 2, again, tells us all power belongs to God, really emphasising the omnipotence of God. And then that key idea that we see in the Shahada is seen here in Surah 47. There is no God but God, the Tawid, the oneness of God, monotheism. And then I love this quote, a really, really well-known quote from the Quran from Surah 50. He is closer to you than your jugular vein, emphasising his closeness and also emphasising your dependence on him. Without God, you could not survive. So why do Muslims need to know what God is like? Why does it matter that Muslims know about the oneness of God, about his omnipotence, about the fact he is merciful and just? Well, it allows Muslims to understand him better. It allows them to follow his rules and expectations, to live in the way he wants them to live. And it strengthens their faith and it strengthens their relationship with him. So it's all about enhancing their life as a Muslim. In terms of God's relationship with the world, we need to know two key terms. We need to know imminence and we need to know transcendence. So imminence is the idea that God is close to and involved within the world, that he is closer than the jugular vein, as we read in Surah 50, and therefore he is vital to human existence. He therefore helps us, inspires us, he gives our lives purpose. And it's a key belief in Islam that without God, life is worse, that, worse excuse me, than death. So the idea of imminence is the idea that God is in the world. He is involved with the world. He is engaged with the world. He takes an active interest in the world and in particular in individual human beings. We then have the idea of transcendence, which is the idea that God is outside the world. He is with his omnipotence above and beyond human understanding, that should say, excuse me, so it can be difficult to fully understand him. It's the idea he's outside time and space because he's the creator of time and space, so he's outside of it, looking down on it. He is eternal, limitless, and as I say, omnipotent. And in this idea of transcendence, we have this idea of being unaffected by the world. Because 
because God transcends the world, he is outside of it and he is unaffected by it. He is greater than the world itself. But of course, God has moments of intervention. For example, the revelation of the Quran to Muhammad via angel Jibril. So what we need to know is that Muslims believe God has a dual relationship with the world. He is both imminent within it and transcendent outside it, above it, and really important that he has this dual relationship with the world. So there is our look at the nature of God, that key idea of the Shahada, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger, as the foundation of Islam. We're going to look now at angels, so this is where we start to see more about that relationship between God and the world, and angels play an instrumental, fundamental part in this. So what are angels in Islam? Angels are spiritual beings created from elements of light. Now, Muslims believe they give messages from God to the prophets and watch over humans. They praise God, but they have no free will. And as I say, one of their key roles is to watch over humanity. What do we read in the Quran about angels then? Surah 35 tells us, praise be to God, creator of the heavens and earth, who made angels with two, three or four pairs of wings. We also read in Surah 2, if anyone is an angel of Jibril, one of the key angels we're going to talk about in a minute, who by God's leave brought down the Quran to you, your heart, confirming previous scripture as a guide and good news for the faithful. So there, recognizing the role angel Jibril plays in revealing the Quran to Muhammad. If anyone is an enemy of God, his angels and his messengers of Jibril and Michal, who is another key angel we're going to talk about, then God is certainly the enemy of such disbelievers. So emphasizing there the importance of angels. So talking of important angels, angel Jibril is the key angel who delivers messages, including the Quran. So it is thought Jibril um, revealed the Quran to Muhammad. So it is through Jibril that God revealed the Quran to Muhammad over a period of 23 years. It is believed that Jibril also taught Muhammad how to pray. So again, another foundational, you know, essential teaching. So he also, Angel Jibril, I'm calling him he, but obviously he's an angel, delivered messages to many prophets. So we have this key idea of Jibril as the messenger, a very, very important messenger, because without Jibril, the message of the Quran would not have been received and therefore Islam would not have been founded by Muhammad. We then have another really important angel, the angel Mikhail, who rewards good deeds with eternal life. So Mikhail is often understood to be the angel of mercy or sustenance with the role of rewarding those who have led good lives. He's seen as a friend to humanity and is one of the first to have bowed down to Adam. He helped Muhammad in battle in the fight for Mecca. He is also believed to bring rain and thunder to the earth. Now, the teaching of Mikhail, so teaching about this angel, reassures Muslims that the reward of eternal life is possible. So there's your focus on the importance of this angel, on the importance of this teaching. What is its impact? What is its influence? There are many angels who have specific roles. We've just mentioned two, and that includes guardian angels. Angels can appear in human form, but they are not like humans. They have no gender and they are part of the unseen world. And as I say, they have no free will because it is essential. They are continually praising God and fulfilling his um, task that he has given them, such as revealing the Quran. Another great quote from um, the Quran on angels, each person has angels before him and behind, watching him, watching over him, excuse me, by God's command. So the idea that angels watch over humans, that's a very important role that they play. So why are they important? Thinking of our exam techniques, thinking of the kind of things AQA could ask us. If they want us to explain why angels are important in Islam, what kind of things could we say? We could say they're important because they act as messengers between God and humanity. So they bridge that gap. They allow the transcendent God to become imminent. They always complete God's tasks. They always obey him because they have no free will. So it's very important that they are fulfilling God's roles and tasks and the duties he's given them. They watch over Muslims, showing us why they're important. There are 13 you could refer to there. They record all thoughts and actions for Judgment Day. So they have a really important role to play in terms of determining who has life after death. 
They greet those in paradise and punish those in hell. And of course, Muslims take the teachings about life after death very seriously. They are one of the six articles of faith for Sunni Muslims that really illustrates, doesn't it, their central role, how foundational they are to the Islamic faith. They have unique roles. They help Muslims understand how to live their lives. They teach them about good moral conduct because, for example, the angel Jibril delivered the message of the Quran. Um, what else do they do? Jibril, I've put there in particular, was given the task of sharing the Quran from God to Muhammad. And at the end of time, an angel will blow the horn to signify the end of the world. So if you were asked about why angels are important, you can be given more generic responses, such as they act as messengers between God and humans. But I think it would be really great to impress the examiner by showing them you have particular understanding of angel Jibril and also angel Mikhail. So you can use those two examples to illustrate the importance of angels. Let's move on now. We're really building on this idea of angels being messengers when we talk about Risala, which means communication. Now, for the 2022 exam, we need to focus on Risala as prophethood. So we're going to be looking at Risala, which is communication between God and humanity through prophets. Now, as I put there, prophets are messengers of God. So they have a really important role to play. And did you know there are believed to be as many as 124,000? Now, 25 of those are named in the Quran, and we are going to focus on three of them today. Now, prophets whose message has been written down are called Rasul. So they have a particularly important role in terms of we can read their teachings and we can read the guidance they want to give us. We can read, in the case of the Quran, the direct infallible word of God. And so there is a continued importance of them for their teachings today. In terms of what we read in our um, scripture, then the Shahada, the words of the Shahada are this. There is no God but God and Muhammad is his messenger. So we're going to look at the particular importance of Muhammad. However, it's not just Muhammad, as we know, who is seen as a prophet. There are many messengers of God. And Surah 10 tells us this. It says every community is sent a messenger. So different communities throughout human history have been sent messengers all the way up to Muhammad, who is known as the seal of the prophet. So why are prophets important? Again, let's think about our AQA exam style questions. What could we say if we were asked to explain why prophets are important? They're a key channel of communication between God and humanity. So they allow us to know God's will and what he wants us to do. They have brought important messages from God. They teach truths, religious truths. They have brought holy books. They show Muslims how to live their lives, which helps them to know how God wants them to live. And they confirm the nature of God through their messages. So again, linking back to our first topic today, the nature of God. And they're a source of wisdom and inspiration. So they're very, very important for Muslims today. Perhaps, no, not perhaps. Let me let me start that again. The most important prophet in Islam is Muhammad, and he is known as the seal of the prophets. That's because he was the final prophet who gave the message of Islam. He founded the Islamic religion and ensured it was unchanged thereafter. Muslims follow his example, the Sunnah today, um, and the Sunnah and Hadith contain written accounts of Muhammad's sayings, customs and traditions, and therefore they provide guidance for Muslims in how to live their lives. Muhammad's calling is a well-known story of the Quran being revealed to him in a cave by the angel Jibril. So look at that. All of these topics we're studying are linking together. This was seen as miraculous because he was illiterate, which means he could not read or write himself, which again emphasizes the truth of the message he had received because he could not read or write and yet he was receiving this extraordinary message this direct revelation of the word of god and it's known of course as the recitation because of the fact he was illiterate so he first went to uh, mecca to try to preach the message that he'd received however the message of the crown was rejected there at first and his life was in danger so he had to escape to Medina and we're going to link this to Hajj when we talk about Hajj pilgrimage in the practices section so again start thinking about these synoptic links and connections across the course there he was welcomed and he became the political and religious 
leader. He set up a belief system with the five pillars. He set up community rules and he delivered the Quran. So he taught, he delivered sermons, for example. This was the first Muslim community. So as you know, I'm sure I'm about to talk to you about why Muhammad was important. There is a really clear example of his importance, not just in terms of revealing the Quran and giving the message of Islam, but in terms of setting up the first Islamic communities, inaugurating those five pillars and being, you know, the fundamental key catalyst for the Islamic religion becoming what it is today. Um, and now following three decisive battles, and we're going to talk about Jihad later on, he returned to Mecca victorious and set up the Kaaba. Again, we'll link that to our conversations about the Hajj later on for the worship of Allah alone, because, of course, that key Islamic belief is Taweed, the oneness of God. So why is Muhammad so important? What influence does he have? What importance does he have? Well, it really cannot be overstated. He is the man who Muslims believe God choose to reveal the Quran through. He is therefore the founder of the Islamic religion. He inaugurated Islamic practices and rituals. He is the perfect example for Muslims to emulate, which we find in the Sunnah, where we find the Prophet's example is recorded. His sayings, customs and traditions, which Muslims seek to emulate. He showed many qualities which Muslims believe would serve them well in their lives today, such as determination, patience, courage, humility. He rejected immorality, which is bad moral conduct. He showed duty and a sense of community. Indeed, he was the creator of the first Islamic community. His words made him a great teacher and he lived the life he preached. He's seen as an exemplary figure. He put his faith and he put his beliefs into practice. He spoke with authority because Muslims believe he was, you know, speaking directly from God because of the revelation of the Quran he'd received. He created rules which benefited everyone within his community. He sought ways for everyone to learn. And, you know, and this is interesting in terms of the context in which Muhammad was operating. He allowed religious freedoms. He allowed rights for women, as well as care for the elderly and the in need. So lots and lots to talk about in terms of the importance of Muhammad. We do also, though, need to know other key prophets in the Islamic history. So Adam, you will know him from our study of Christianity. In Islam, I'm going to describe him to you as an exemplar of stewardship, so as the first Khalifa, and this is why he's important. So Adam was, according to Islamic teachings, Excuse me, let's have some water to do apologize. He was the first prophet and human to be created. He is known, therefore, as the father of humankind and a prophet until his death. He built the first Kaaba and taught that the next life is eternal. So again, foundational key Islamic teachings, despite the fact that he lived many, many, many years before Muhammad. His task was to be a steward, a caretaker for the world, as we know from theme B, religion and life, to be a Khalifa. He teaches Muslims, or his example, I should say, teaches Muslims today, that they should also look after and care for God's creation. He was given Hawa, known as Eve in the Christian story, a woman for company. However, as we know, they disobeyed God, they failed the test from Iblis, Satan, and they were banished to earth instead of living in the Garden of Eden. However, and here's where we see more examples of the nature of God. They asked for forgiveness and God was merciful. So that exemplified God's mercy, his forgiveness. And Adam then taught people about God. So he did wrong, but he repented and was forgiven. And therefore, he's an exemplar for Muslims today. He is an example of stewardship, of being a Khalifa, and of being a good follower of God. Ibrahim then is our next key prophet, and he is going to be known as an exemplar of faith. So Ibrahim, also known as Abraham, believed in one true God. So again, this idea of monotheism and rejected the idea of gods and statues, which is something Muhammad did in um, met in the um, Arabian culture he was living in at the time. So Ibrahim preached this message, but was often rejected, much like Muhammad when he first started preaching his message of the oneness of God. God then sent a miracle to save Ibrahim when people tried to burn him, not ideal, is it? And then people started to follow him. So 
Here's the really key thing, I think, about Ibrahim. So not only is he a key pioneer of monotheism, you know, we talk about the Abrahamic faith of Judaism, Christianity and Islam, all being united because of Abraham, Ibrahim's teaching of monotheism. But then this is the really important bit that's recorded in the Quran in Surah 37. It's when God tests his faith. And that's why I'm calling him an example of faith. He demonstrates the amount of faith Muslims aspire to. So God tested him. He tested his faith by asking him to sacrifice his son. Abraham, because of his faith in God, was willing to sacrifice his son. And God was pleased and then sent a ram for sacrifice instead. So he is therefore an exemplar of faith. And it's all about Muslims asking themselves, how strong is my faith? Would I follow God's command to sacrifice my own child, for example? And they, you know, they want to have the strength of faith that Ibrahim showed in Surah 37 there. And this is marked, this is celebrated at Eid al-Adha, which remembers this event, the festival of, festival, excuse me, of sacrifice. Um, and also, what else did Ibrahim do? He later rebuilt the Kaaba. So again, connecting the dots, looking at all these prophets coming together um, with his son, who later led the community in Mecca. So just to bring all of this together, Adam, our key exemplar of stewardship, we've got a link to theme B there that shows Adam's importance for Muslims today as this role model, as this example of stewardship. And then we've got with Ibrahim, the idea of him being an exemplar of faith. It links to practices to show Ibrahim's importance for Muslims today, not just as a role model, but also because of the festival that is celebrated because of Ibrahim. So we're talking here about the festival of sacrifice, Eid al-Adha, also the end of Hajj. And this remembers Ibrahim's willingness to sacrifice his son when God asked him to because of the strength of his faith. It's known as a test of faith. This story, as we know, is found in Surah 37, and it reminds Muslims of the test of faith faced by Ibrahim and how they should apply this to their own lives, as well as the mercy shown by God, because he didn't get him to sacrifice his son. As we've said, he sent a ram instead. So keep on looking at how these key ideas all come together and make those connections in your mind. It will really, really help you when you're answering the questions in the exam room. We're going to move on now to holy books, and we're going to focus on the Quran, which is, of course, the most important holy book in Islam. And this links in very nicely with uh, Risala, with prophethood and the importance of Muhammad. So the Quran, it is 114 surahs long. The word itself means recitation. This is because God spoke it via the angel Jibril to Muhammad, who was illiterate. He was unable to read or write. And therefore, the revelation of the Quran is seen as a miracle. So Let's start to explore this. Just as an FYI, the Quran is always read in Arabic. Now, the idea here is to preserve God's word. And it all comes down to the idea of Quran meaning recitation. You want to preserve God's words in their purest original form. Muslims believe that in terms of worship, it cannot be truly studied in other languages, as its true meaning is only found in the original Arabic. So. Surah 53 of the Quran says about itself, the Quran is nothing less than a revelation that is sent to him. It was taught to him by an angel with mighty powers and great strength. So that really encapsulates these key ideas about the Quran, doesn't it? This idea of the Quran being a revelation that is then recited by the illiterate Muhammad that has been sent from God. It's directly from God. It's the hotline from heaven. And it is taught by the angel Jibril, who plays that instrumental role. And we've spoken already, haven't we, about the really important role of angels, Jibril and Mikhail, for example. Another great quote from the Quran about the Quran is from Surah 10. Nor could this Quran have been devised by anyone other than God. It confirms what was revealed before it and is an explanation of the scripture. This is really important in terms of that link with earlier holy books, uh, such as the Gospels, for example, uh, and the Torah. So the Quran and Muhammad as the seal of the prophets, the seal of the communication, the pinnacle, if you like, of the message. And a really key idea there, no one 
could have devised the Quran other than God. It has come directly from God and therefore it is infallible. It is treated with great respect. It is seen as the absolute unquestionable source of wisdom and authority in Islam. So let's talk about the authority of the Quran for Muslims and that key command word from our exam, importance. What is the importance of the Quran? It contains the true words of God and is the direct revelation of God. Remember, we know that worshipping God is the most important thing Muslims can do and therefore they're going to see the Quran as 100% important if it contains God's words. It has God's authority and is therefore without error. We could call that inerrant. We could also refer to it as being infallible. It is unchanging and unchangeable. And this links with the fact it's always read in Arabic. It's to preserve God's words. They shouldn't be translated. They shouldn't be up for discussion or interpretation. They must be preserved because they are unchanging and unchangeable. Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. That's seal has been put in place and it must remain in place so it cannot now be changed it cannot be criticized it is seen as a miracle as we've said which emphasizes its importance and the authority it has it's not just another book it is a miracle it is the direct revelation of god it is of course a miracle because muhammad was illiterate it is greater than any book that a man could produce especially somebody who is illiterate and cannot read or write this really illustrates its significance its authority its importance it covers every aspect of life influencing and guiding a person throughout their life so it is your ultimate one-stop shop, if you like. It contains everything you need to know, demonstrating its importance and fundamental significance. It explains ultimate questions. It is a basis for Sharia law. Um, and of course, Muslims believe that the laws of God are always superior to the laws of man. How do Muslims therefore use the Quran? So we can see here how important it is. You know, as I say, I cannot overstate its importance to you. It is the most important book. It is the most important text. And it contains all of those teachings. It contains everything Muslims need to know. And they try to live their lives by what they read in the Quran. So how do they use the Quran? Well, it's used in daily worship, showing just how important it is in Islamic life that it is used every single day. Verses are spoken in daily worship, in particular on a Friday in the Jummah service, Friday prayers, in celebrations, festivals and at rites of passage. The Quran is read from, the Quran is present. It is, of course, not only used in celebrations and worship, but also in terms of the law. So it's a source of Sharia law for Islamic matters. So in Islamic countries around the world today, the Quran is the foundational text for the entire legal system. It is a source of wisdom, inspiration, guidance and support. It provides important answers and direction. Remember, Muslims believing it is the infallible, absolute, inerrant, direct revelation of God. It is a source of explanation and insight, and it is no surprises here, treated with great respect and reverence. There are, however, other holy books. And as you can see here, we are going to focus in terms of our exploration of these on the contrasting views about them. So again, using our exam language, referring to our key command words from AQA. So in Islam, there are other holy books. As we know, the Torah, for example, revelations given to Musa, Moses, by God, and now, according to Islamic teachings, lost. Excuse me, guys, I just need some water. No longer existing in their original form. Uh, Torah was put together by Moses' followers after his death using parts of the original text, but adding their own. So Muslims believe the original Torah has been lost. Now, it is talked about in the Quran as providing guidance and light. So it's very, very important in Islam, however, not considered the direct word of God, because of course that is the Quran. We then have the scrolls of Ibrahim, who of course we've spoken about today. Again, look at all these connections that we've got coming together. He is always called the upright one, always faithful to God, as we say. That's why we celebrate the festival of sacrifice. That's why we focus on his willingness to sacrifice his son at God's instruction. It is believed he received revelations on the first day of Ramadan and they came in parable-like stories. They cover issues of worship, reflection, etc. 
So again, Ibrahim's importance is becoming very clear to us, isn't it? We then have the Gospels, where we read about Isa, also known as Jesus, who is seen as an important prophet in Islam. The Gospels were the account of Jesus's life and death written by his followers after he died. And Muslims do believe that he died. They do not believe, although in Islam there is a key teaching about resurrection, they do not believe, of course, that Jesus is the son of God. They believe, however, he is an important prophet. Muslims believe they contain many mistakes, such as I've put in that box there, no pun intended. They contain many mistakes as they, again, are not the direct word of God. That is only the Quran revealed to Muhammad via angel Jibril, who is the seal of the prophets. And then we have the Psalms, a collection of prayers and poems by, by Dawood, the great king, given by God as a form of guidance, which Dawood recited as songs and poems. And Muslims believe a version of this is found in the Bible. Again, it's this idea that the original version has been lost. It has been changed. It has lost some of its authority and its meaning and its significance as a result. So what do we read in the Quran about these other books? Well, in Surah 5, we read, we sent Jesus, son of Mary, in their footsteps to confirm the Torah that had been sent before them. He we gave him, excuse me, the gospel with guidance, light and confirmation of the Torah already revealed. So Surah 5, really acknowledging here these other holy books, the other texts that do exist. However, the key message we keep on coming back to is that they are not considered the direct word of God. They do not tell you the full story. They contain fragments of the truth. They contain some important messages, but it is only the Quran and, of course, Muhammad as the seal of the prophets that can give you the complete picture. That can be the seal of the prophets and tell you the full story. So, what is the authority and importance of these books for Muslims today? Again, using our AQA exam style language. Well, we can say the Quran refers to all these books. There are five does so there in our blue box. So they must be important. We know that Muhammad learned and taught from these books. So they are important. They helped him. They shaped his thinking. They may have shaped his sermons and his worldview. So they're very, very important for understanding the development of Muhammad's Islam and for understanding, you know, how Muhammad understood the world. They are connected to well-respected prophets. So linking it to Rissala, giving them authority, and they give God's guidance, even if not perfectly. So as I say, they contain fragments, but not the full picture. So they still have significance um, and they do still have value. However, and here's where our contrasting views kick in. Some are lost now. You know, for example, the original text of the Torah is thought to have been lost. And so no one knows what they actually say, what they originally said. So as we've just said about the Quran, how it's preserved in Arabic to protect God's direct word, these texts have maybe been changed. There have been changes over the years. And therefore, Muslims may ask, how much can we trust them? How much of this can we believe? Some have been changed, so this might take away some of their authority. As I say, we're not sure what is the original truth and what might have been chopped and changed. If important, it could be asked, why were they not preserved? How did they end up being changed and little bits of them being lost, for example? So it could be argued they must not be that important. The Quran is more important. And that's why I've put as the last bullet point there, some Muslims may believe the Quran has more authority than all of them together as it is the word of God unchanged. And so you can still acknowledge the importance of these other texts, but they are not the most important. And just thinking there of maybe a potential question five AQA could ask us about the importance of different holy books and explaining why Muslims do not believe these other texts are as important as the Quran, which is, of course, revealed by Muhammad to be the direct revelation from God, as absolute, as complete, and telling you the full story, whereas these other holy books can only give us fragments, if you see what I mean, can give us pieces of the jigsaw, but not the full picture. We're going to move on to our final beliefs and teachings topic now, which is the MMA, which is specific to Shia Islam. And this is a great opportunity for us to look at that distinction between Sunni and Shia Muslims. So Sunni Muslims make up 85 percent roughly of the global Islamic community. 
Sunni Muslims believe that imams should be selected on merit. So leadership within Islam should be a case of meritocracy. Who is the best man for the job? Who is the best man to lead the community? Has he got the best understanding of the Quran, for example? Who is the most knowledgeable, the most wise? Who is going to be, as I've put there, the best man for the job? So a little bit like the prime minister, yeah? The idea that you, in the UK, that you vote for the best man or woman, of course, in the UK, best man or woman for the job. This leads to what happened originally in terms of the succession of the leadership from Muhammad. So Muhammad's close friend and advisor, Abu Bakr, became his first successor. He was judged to be the best man for the job. It wasn't because he was related to um, Muhammad. It was because he was seen as the best man for the job. In contrast, we see in Shia Islam, the idea that imams are spiritual descendants, that there is some connection to the bloodline of Muhammad. We're going to unpack this. So 15% of the worldwide Islamic population um, is thought to be Shia, roughly, and they believe that an imam is someone sinless by nature, who has infallible authority, so they cannot be wrong. And this is because of the idea of spiritual descendancy. And in terms of the successorship in the earliest days of Islam, they believe that Muhammad's cousin, and son-in-law Ali bin Abu Talib should have become his first successor because of their blood relationship. This I like to remember as the British royal family. Yeah, so let's think about it in Britain. Sunnis would be people electing a prime minister, whereas Shia would be the um, queen's son taking the throne after her. It's about bloodline. So is it about merit and being the best man for the job, or is it about bloodline and having spiritual descendancy, as we call it, a really fancy term, which I think really encapsulates what we're trying to say. So in terms of Sunni Islam and this idea of how an imam is selected, Ari Online tells us, as long as the leader ruled under God, following the guidance of the Quran and Sunnah, it was a role that could be filled by any man based on his piety and wisdom. Leadership was to be by merit, not by inheritance, birth or family. In contrast, if you look at the Shia approach to this at Imamet, the close relationship between Muhammad and Ali provides, excuse me, the Shia with a clear model of what an imam should be. The Quran refers to Ali as Muhammad's nafs, which can be translated as something like soul or inner self. So Ali was seen as having the same inner light as Muhammad. In other words, he inherited from him the light of divine guidance. So again, spiritual descendancy. This is really, really important when it comes to understanding imamate. It's this idea of spiritual descendancy, which means, and this is the important bit, imams are infallible. So let's unpack this. First things first, one of the five roots of Usul ad-Din, which is our key source of teachings in Shia, is Shia Islam is imamat, this idea of leadership. And it's this idea that imams are spiritual successors to Muhammad, and they are chosen by God. So they are not chosen as the best man for the job by other people. They are chosen by God. So it's the belief in Shia Islam that all modern imams should now be spiritual descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. They are appointed by God to be Muhammad's successors. They are therefore inspired by God. They are without sin and they are infallible. This means they can interpret the teachings of the Quran without making any errors. Shia Muslims believe that imams are exemplary individuals who are appointed by God. They obey all teachings and follow Sharia law and they are best placed to interpret the Quran without error. And as I've put there, this really shows their importance. We do trace all of this back to that original succession that took place after the death of Muhammad. So Shia Muslims and Shia Muslims, known as the party of Ali, believe that Ali was the rightful successor to Muhammad as they were related. And that is your key thing to know. This idea of spiritual descendancy, of inheriting that inner light, of inheriting that infallibility from Muhammad, which shows their importance and which shows their significance. 
Just to let you know, the Twelvers is a branch of Shia Islam, whose followers believe that there were 12 Imams after the death of Muhammad. They believe the 12th Imam has been kept alive by God and is hidden somewhere on earth. Shia Muslims believe the 12th Imam will one day make himself known and then bring equality to all. Shia Muslims believe that Imams are necessary because people need guidance on how to live correctly. Due to their particularly close relationship with God, the 12 Imams are highly respected. So in terms of what's going to happen on the exam, we need to know about the importance of Imamah in Shia Islam, about the reasons why Imams are so important and the role, the special role they have as a source of wisdom and teaching, as interpreters, correct interpreters of the Quran, who are without sin, who are inspired by God, who are chosen by God, and who are infallible. We're going to look now at the practices. So we've had a look at those key beliefs and teachings, and now we're going to look how they translate into practices. So again, there are lots of connections and lots of links we're going to make between the beliefs and teachings and now the practices. For the 2022 exam, we need to know about prayer, salah, we need to know about almsgiving, Zaka, we need to know about pilgrimage, the Hajj, we need to know about lesser and greater jihad, which means struggle, and we need to know about, excuse me, I'm just on the green tea now, guys. Come on, we're halfway there. We need to know about festivals. So festivals is a great way to link together the beliefs and teachings and how they translate into practice because the festivals are all about celebrating key beliefs and teachings. For example, about Ibrahim as the key prophet who is an exemplar of faith. As always, we've got our key quotes in blue. Sirah chapter five says, when you are about to pray, wash your faces and your hands and arms up to the elbows. Wipe your heads, wash your feet up to the ankles, and if required, wash your whole body. So this is wudu, the idea of preparing for prayer. And it really illustrates for us that all of the practices we're going to talk about today have their foundations in the Quran. Again, emphasizing from beliefs and teachings how important the Quran is as a teacher for Muslims and as the source of instruction for Muslims. And it really illustrates that connection between the key beliefs and teachings and then the practices that are performed by Muslims today. And the practices section is a brilliant opportunity to show off your understanding of how Muslims express their faith in the world today. So the first thing we're going to talk about is Salah, which is, of course, prayer. Shia Muslims, who we've just spoken about, pray three times a day. That's a total of 17 sequences. And Sunni Muslims pray at five times a day. And that comes again to a total of 17 sequences. And a key difference, just so you're ready if you get a question on this, is that Shia make different positions, for example, touching the head to a block of wood, not to the floor, as Sunnis do. Key quote then about prayer. Surah 40 says, Call on me and I will answer you. A key quote from uh, God there. Surah 62 says, remember God often so that you may prosper. So again, the importance of regular prayer throughout the day. And we'll be asking how important is it to pray and how often should you pray? Surah 62 is telling us that remembering God often, so praying to him five times a day throughout your day, will allow you to prosper, really exemplifying its importance. So talking of importance, why is Salah, why is prayer so important for Muslims? So Surah 96 prescribes prayer. It tells Muslims to prostrate and draw near to God. So again, therefore telling you the purpose of prayer, the importance of prayer is that it will allow you to draw near to God. It will bring you closer to God. It will lead to you entering paradise. So there is a connection between the practices you perform and the rewards you receive. It brings knowledge and awareness of God. It is a time to reflect on God, to focus on your faith, and therefore it strengthens your faith. It ensures God is not forgotten throughout the day. So as Surah 62 instructs, remember God often. It's a reminder of the greatness of God. You're bowing down before him, literally bowing down with your body, which then leads to that mental reminder. Uh, you can say it leads to humility and modesty. It brings discipline, order, peace and calm, which will benefit your character. You know, human beings appreciate routine. They appreciate structure. Uh, it encourages good behavior and deeds because you're remembering God and you're, you know, 
bowing down before him. He wants to put his teachings into practice. His teachings, of course, found in the Quran. It prevents sin because you are, again, being reminded of God. Uh, it, you know, it prevents bad thoughts and actions because you are focusing yourself. You are recentering yourself on your faith on God. Prayer in the mosque brings even greater rewards. And then it is a reminder of human insignificance. Because again, you are bowing down before God and you are remembering the words of the Shahada and it strengthens faith and can also bring peace. Excuse me, Gavin, just having some apple. Do excuse me. Got to be done, guys. Got to be done. Do get yourselves a snack. We're doing very well. And then it is strengthening faith and it is bringing peace. So. In terms of preparing for prayer, what's happening? What's going on? Well, the words of the Adam, the call to prayer, are said, and then the men will go to mosque. Women may also go to mosque, but pray separately in a separate room, or the women will stay at home. But the call to prayer goes out, which calls people, believe it or not, to pray. So shoes will then be removed and wudu, the ritual washing process, is carried out. This is not necessarily about just cleaning your body, but it's about spiritual cleansing as well for purity of mind, getting yourself into the mindset for prayer. Muslims will stand shoulder to shoulder um, and they will then make their intention to pray. Really important that they are facing the direction of Mecca. And we're going to talk about Mecca in a moment when we talk about the Hajj pilgrimage. We then have the rakas and recitation. So these are carried out five times every day for Sunni Muslims, three times a day for Shia Muslims. Both Sunni and Shia Muslims total 17 sequences of prayer each day by way of rakas and recitations, which refers to movements and words. Each sequence, which is known as a raka, has a number of different physical positions. Sujud means kneeling down with the forehead touching the floor, or as we've said, a wooden block for Shia Muslims, which shows total submission to God. It's the idea of bowing down to him. Now, remember, the word Islam itself means submission to God. So with Salah, you are literally putting your faith into practice. You're putting it into action because the whole point of the religion is submission to God. You are physically, you are literally submitting to God, really illustrating there the importance of Salah as a reminder of God, as a moment for connection with God, and as an act of submission to God. Each physical position includes saying aloud a Quranic recitation. And of course, from our belief and teaching section, we know why that is so important, because we know that the Quran is the direct revelation of God, the word of God, the infallible, unchangeable word of God. Uh, another couple of key terms you need to know, the doers are private prayers, often said after set prayers in the mosque when you get home. And then Katib is the imam who delivers the sermon at the Friday prayers. And again, in beliefs and teachings, we spoke, didn't we, about the importance of imams as experts on the Quran and as leaders for their communities. So we need to know about two different types of prayer. And we're going to take a look at some AO2 questions. So we're going to be asking are prayers for men and women equally important and why? Are prayers at the mosque or at home more important and why? Are salah prayers more important or the dua prayers, those private prayers? And how often should you pray? Should it be three times? Should it be five times? Could we refer to Surah 62, for example? So let's first of all talk about the Jumma prayers, the Friday prayers. And remember, the holy day of the week in Islam is Friday. So con congregational prayers, excuse me, at the mosque at noon on a Friday. They are the best attended of the week and it is believed great rewards will come from attending. Again, that connection between your conduct in this world and your destiny in the next. Men are expected to attend and missing four Fridays is considered to make them less of a believer, emphasizing the importance of attendance. And this all comes down to that idea of gathering together as a community. Islam is very much a community based religion, isn't it? It's about coming together as a community, as a group. 
and that's why regular attendance is so important. The Adan is called, as we've said, wudu is performed, um, and often Muslims may make dua, so private prayers, as they wait for the sermon. The Katib then delivers the first part in the language of the community as a teaching tool. So he may discuss community or social issues, for example. The second part is then delivered in Arabic and is a set speech. The ikam is then read and two rakas are performed. Often Muslims do four rakas by themselves before the two compulsory ones and then two after, copying Muhammad. We then have, on the other hand, prayer at home. For women, salah prayers are often done at home. Now, as I've said, they can attend the mosque if there is a separate area set aside for them. They are performed in exactly the same way. There is the, the ritual washing, wudu, the fact that you are making sure you're facing Mecca, and then the use of a prayer mat. The expectation to carry out salah is the same for men and women. Prayers can be done, of course, at any time of the day at home. They are more personal and a time for opening up to God, who is always seen as being there to hear prayers. You know, Muslims may ask in this time for help, for forgiveness, for support. There are no rackets involved in personal prayer, so words will be freely used. Doers are often said by families before meet meal times as well to break fasts or at special occasions. And some Muslims will also pray at night, emulating Muhammad again. So, as I've said, these key questions that we have got about prayer, about the different types of prayer in Islam, about where to pray, when to pray, and how to pray. And we need to start thinking in that AO2 mindset of the different opinions people may have. So, for example, are prayers at the mosque or at home more important, or could you lead to a conclusion that they are equally important? How often should prayer take place? Why is regular prayer so important for Muslims? What impact does it have? What importance does it have? Why is it seen as so essential in a Muslim's daily life and routine? A great quote there from Surah 62 verse 9 telling us, when the call to prayer is made, the Adan, on the day of congregation on Friday, hurry towards the reminder of God. So remember, prayers, the call to prayer is a reminder of God, illustrating its importance, illustrating its significance, and leave off your trading. That is better for you if only you knew. So it is better to pray than to be at work. That really exemplifies and emphasizes the importance of attending prayer, doesn't it? And of coming together as a congregation. This idea that praying at the mosque as a collective will bring great re rewards, excuse me. It is more significant than praying alone. And as I said before, this reflects the fact Islam is a religion of community, coming together in submission to God, gathering together to praise God, to bow down before God, and to connect as a community. And of course, it's, you know, it's this constant um, discussion that we're having as RE students about strengths and weaknesses, about comparisons, and considering how we could be asked about this in our uh, question five, and how we could present both sides of the argument. Where should a Muslim pray? Which is more important or are they both equally important? And as long as you can justify what you're writing, you can secure your marks. We're going to look now at another of our pillars of Islam, which is Zakat. And we're also looking at Qums. So Zakat is charity. It means charity. And it is very much a directive from the Quran. It is a religious obligation because it is a directive from the Quran that is all about purifying your wealth. So this is because Muslims believe wealth is on loan from God. And so some should be used to help those in need because everyone's been created by God. We are all part of a worldwide community and therefore we need to help those who are in need. As I say, it's all about purifying your wealth. A sum of 2.5% is therefore paid as a tax on income and savings um, and they're given to the mosque for distribution to community causes. 
And it's this idea that to help each other is to help God because everybody's been created by God and the world has been created by God. So linking in with that idea of stewardship and Adam being an exemplar of stewardship of being a good Khalifa. And so giving should be done willingly because God doesn't just know what you do, but he also knows your intentions. So you need to give from a place of love, a place of compassion with genuine willingness to help others. Because God doesn't just judge you based on what you do and whether you follow his rules, but also on your intentions. He knows your thoughts. Now, who pays that cat? Children do not have to, but some guardians may on their behalf. All adults, however, who do meet the criteria must give. And the NISAB threshold refers to the minimum amount that a Muslim must have before being obliged to pay. And now in Muslim countries, Muslims will pay, pay zakat, excuse me, as Sharia law prescribes, whereas Muslims in the West will give a cash equivalent via the mosque, for example. But if Sharia law is the law of the land, then that can be enforced by the state, whereas obviously in the UK, for example, that would be coordinated on a more local level by the mosque. So what are the benefits of giving zakat? What is its importance? Again, our key exam language, our key exam terminology. Why is it important? Why is it so significant? Well, as we said, it's all about purifying and cleansing your wealth. So yes, it's all about what you're doing for others because you're helping others, but it's also about what it does for you and your wealth. Giving zakat, so paying your 2.5%, means that your remaining 97.5%, is that your remaining... That's really bad math. 97.5%, I'm going to say, correct me if I'm wrong, mathematicians, is clean. So it purifies your remaining wealth. Sharing the blessings of wealth with others prevents greed, which is essential in terms of those Islamic values of modesty and in terms of your moral development as a Muslim, growing in compassion, growing in care for others. The money benefits both the giver, as we've said, in terms of purifying their wealth and storing up good deeds for heaven. And it also, of course, benefits the receiver. It's believed in Islam that the giver will receive a hundredfold back in the afterlife what they have given. And so they should feel satisfaction after giving. And of course, because God knows intentions, they should also be keen to give before they do so. It's also important because if everybody gave it, then there would be no poor in the world. So you could see it as fulfilling that duty of being a Khalifa and being a good steward, helping others who have all been created by God, looking after his world, looking after his creation, doing what you can, doing your bit to help those in need. Um, and then it fulfills a religious duty and obligation. As I say, it's important because it's a directive from the Quran. It fulfills your religious duty and your obligation to those in need, to God. It is the third pillar of Islam. So in terms of our scriptural foundations for this, then, whatever you spend with a good heart, give it to parents, relatives, orphans, the helpless and travellers in need. Whatever good you do, Allah is aware of it. So Surah 2 there outlining who should receive zakat and also telling you why you should do it, because whatever good you do, God will know about it. But that first sentence very important there from surah 2 outlining the criteria of who should receive zakat the same from surah 9 alms are only for the poor and the needy and those who collect the money those whose hearts are to be reconciled captives debtors in the cause of god and wayfarers so again outlining who is receiving this money and Again, demonstrating why it's so important, because it will help these people. And that's putting your faith into action. It's been given as a direction from God, as an instruction from God, but also it allows you to worship God because you are caring for his creation. You are showing compassion. You are showing kindness. And that will ultimately benefit you as a Muslim as well. Now, in Shia Islam, we also have this idea of kums, which means a fifth or 20% in Arabic. Now, this is the sixth of the 10 obligatory acts in Shia Islam. So, of course, the word obligatory means you must do it. It is necessary. It is essential. Now, this tax is paid on any profit earned by Shia Muslims. Traditionally, and this is significant, the recipients of Qums have been descendants of Muhammad. So, again, we can link that in with that idea of the imamat, can't we? This idea of hereditary 
descendant fee. It also is spent on education projects, on helping those in need within the Shia Islamic faith and anybody who is in need of support. And the scriptural foundation from um, the Quran for this is Surah 8. Know that whatever other things you acquire, a fifth of it is for Allah, for the messenger, for the near relative. So again, this idea of bloodline and connections and the orphans, the needy and the wayfarer. So for Shia Muslims, why is Qums also important? Well, it gives special recognition to Muhammad, to his descendants and leaders within Shia Islam who are the spiritual descendants of Muhammad, as we know from our ideas and our insights into imams in Shia uh, Islam the imamate. It's used to help build Islamic schools or projects that helps to develop people's understanding of Islam, allowing them to grow closer to God and to follow Muhammad's teachings. It helps those in need. It promotes Islam through those education pro pro can't speak, excuse me, projects, and it is one of the 10 obligatory acts. I mean, if you're talking about the importance of something, if it's obligatory, that's really clear, isn't it? It's really crystal clear why it's important, because it is an obligation, and it is seen as a duty. But again, this is a great chance to just refresh our understanding and build our understanding of this idea of descendancy in Shia Islam. Let's move on now, shall we, to our next practice which is another of the pillars and it is the Hajj pilgrimage so Hajj is a pilgrimage a pilgrimage of course is a holy journey it's a sacred journey in this case to Mecca in Saudi Arabia in modern day Saudi Arabia it is held annually and it lasts five days and some two million over two million Muslims attend now it is the fifth pillar of Islam and the rituals that take place were established by Muhammad. So it is absolutely steeped in tradition and we can trace back so much of what happens to the time of Muhammad. So really illustrating its importance and its significance. In terms of its importance then, it is again mandated by the Quran. So in the same way that Zakah is mandated by the Quran, we see it in uh, Surah 3, 97 here, that pilgrimage to the house of God is a duty owed to God by people who are able to undertake it. So those who are able to travel to Mecca, to the Kaaba in particular, which we're going to look at in a moment, it's something you must do. It is a duty owed to God. So as part of your worship of God, as part of your life as a Muslim, you have this duty to go on this pilgrimage. That is how important and significant it is. In Surah 2, verse 158, we read Safa and Mawa and among the rites of God. So for those who make major or minor pilgrimages to the house, it is no offence to circulate between the two. We're going to be looking at that particular action as part of the pilgrimage in a moment. So why they go there? This is what we need to start thinking about. Why do Muslims go to Mecca on this pilgrimage. Why is this so significant and so important? Well, here's the answer. It's all about the influence and the impact it has. Obviously, it's all about following in the footsteps of Muhammad and, you know, connecting. I was going to say reconnecting, but it might be for the first time that somebody is connecting with the roots of their religion. And it's all about the influence, as I say, and the impact it has on the individual and on the community. So it allows Muslims to feel part of the united Ummah, which is the worldwide Islamic community. It leads to a feeling of equality. Everybody is wearing the same. Everybody is doing the same thing. Everybody is equal before God and on pilgrimage. They feel closer to God. Of course, you are going to the house of God. You are going to the most sacred and holy sites in the religion, those sites and locations where God intervened, where God connected and spoke to prophets via the angels. It means that you will feel strengthened in your faith whilst you're there because, you know, you've been brought up hearing about these really important places. You know, every single time that you pray, you are facing Mecca. And now you're actually there. You're going to feel so strengthened in your faith, aren't you? It reminds Muslims of what is important, puts everything into perspective, for example, a reminder of the importance of their religion and, you know, how significant 
Islamis as part of their identity as an individual. There are opportunities for the forgiveness of sins. So you might see this pilgrimage as a new start, as a new beginning. It is obviously going to be emotional, seeing the Kaaba, actually being there at the house of God, at these key sacred sites is going to be emotional. And then of course, longer term. So it's not just about the impact whilst the Muslim is there, but it's about how they then go forwards in life. So it will lead to a stronger faith, and a stronger relationship with God, maybe. You might have a new found focus on your religion, feeling more respected in the community. And um, because you now have this wisdom and you have been on this journey, so people may come to you to ask you about it and to learn from you. Uh, it means you may be seen as a source of spiritual advice. It means you may be more focused on being a good Muslim, on following the faith. Um, and putting the teachings of the religion into practice. So again, this idea, it strengthens your faith, it reinvigorates you, it renews your commitment to the religion. It may lead to you feeling more purpose and more peace in your life. And it may also mean you feel strengthened as a Muslim, as I've said, and also more committed to helping those in need. As I say, putting your faith into practice. So some concrete examples of this then, that idea of feeling a sense of, equality with others and feeling part of the Ummah is seen in the fact that two million pilgrims visit every year. So you are going to be surrounded by so many fellow Muslims and you're going to feel this sense of community with them and this feeling of equality. As I say, you're all wearing the same, you're all doing the same, you are all together for a very particular purpose, which is to fulfill your religious duty, to feel closer to God. We can also link it to um, the strengthening of your faith in terms of when you're praying and you're circling the Kaaba, you're going to be feeling that your faith is being strengthened and that you're growing in your understanding and your relationship with God. What else have we got? Um, a particular time in the pilgrimage when you may feel that there is opportunity for forgiveness and a new start is when you visit the Mount of Mercy. Um, in terms of that stronger relationship with God is going to be seen at the Zamzam well with the Zamzam water, where it's a great reminder of humans dependence on God for life, in particular for their spiritual life. Um, in terms of you therefore become a source of spiritual advice, the Hajj is of course the fifth and the final pillar. So it's often a once in a lifetime thing. Many people in the community may not have been yet. So you would become in your community at home, a source of advice and a source of wisdom and insight because you have been and therefore you can teach people and share your experience. Um, in terms of feeling more purpose and peace in life, the experience teaches patience. It's quite grueling. You know, it requires a lot of endurance, which is why those who are not well are not supposed to go because it does require a lot of patience and it does require a lot of endurance. And so that in itself can have a really influential impact on somebody. And it, of course, provides time for people to reflect. And then in terms of that strengthening of your faith, the feast of sacrifice, where you remember Abraham's faith, Ibrahim's faith, excuse me, is a really great reminder isn't it? And so it's all about the influence and impact of these experiences on Muslims. In terms of what actually happens, then, let's break it down. So here we are. I'm going to talk you through the location things happen, the rituals performed at that location, and then, and here's the important bit, the purpose, significance, and importance of that act. So in terms of the journey to and the arrival at the Hajj in modern day Saudi Arabia, Muslims will put on the Iram, which is the white seamless robes, and they will have also entered the spiritual state of Iram. The purpose of this then is to show unity and equality, as we've just said, because everyone's dressed identically. It's also about strengthening a feeling of commitment to and community with the Ummah. Everybody is together, everybody is wearing the same, everybody is united in a common purpose at this place. At the Great Mosque then, we have the Tawaf, which is where you circle the Kaaba, the House of God, seven times in an anti-clockwise direction. This again, with everybody circulating together, demonstrates the unity of all Muslims together in submission to Allah, and of course it shows your love for and again your submission to God. 
at um, Alfafa and Almawa Hills, um, we see the running between the two hills and then drinking or taking water from the Zamzam well. Now, this is about remembering Hadja, who was Ibrahim's wife, who was searching for water for their son. And the wellspring was then that appeared was then seen as a miracle from God. So it's really spiritually significant, linking again to Ibrahim. And this act shows dependence on God as a source of spiritual life and as a source of life in general that he provides for you that he is the source of your life and existence at Mount Arafat also known as the Mount of Mercy then Muslims take the stand where Muslims will praise God read from the Quran and importantly ask for forgiveness linking in with the nature of God where we started the session talking about that idea of God being the giver of mercy, as we read in the Quran. This is the site where Adam and Hawa were reunited and Muhammad gave his final sermon. So very, very significant and linking those key prophets together. And Muslims here hope to be forgiven. It is the Mount of Mercy and an opportunity for forgiveness and for a new start. At Minar then, uh, Muslims collection throw stones at the three pillars, which are representing Iblis, the devil, Satan, and also evil. And also here, an animal is sacrificed, men's hair is shaved, and women cut off a lock of their hair. This symbolizes rejection of the devil, of evil, by throwing the stones. It celebrates Eid al Adha, the feast of sacrifice, when, as we know, Ibrahim was prepared to sacrifice his son for God. So it's a reminder of faith, of submission to God. So again, linking here with those key beliefs and teachings. And then cutting your hair is a symbol of purity. We then have at Medina praying at the Prophet's mosque. Now, this is the place of the first mosque and Muslim community set up by Muhammad. So again, you're following in the footsteps of Muhammad, bringing you closer to God, you know, developing your religious identity, developing your understanding and strengthening your faith. And then it's believed that all prayers said here will be heard and accepted by God. So really particularly important place for prayer. And then finally, at the Great Mosque again, we return to Tawaf, where you will again circle the Kaaba seven times. And it's an opportunity to see the holiest shrine for one last time. Now, in terms of the Kaaba then, it is the house of God and it is the holiest site in Islam. It is situated at the centre of Islam's most important mosque in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. And it is central, as we said, to the Hajj pilgrimage, this idea that the Quran commands you visit the house of God. Now, this is a really interesting um, location in terms of its history. It is believed to have been rebuilt several times throughout history, including by Ibrahim, who we have spoken about a lot today as this key exemplar of faith and as this key prophet who plays an important role in the Islamic story and in the life of Muslims today, as seen in the festivals that celebrate his willingness to sacrifice his son for God. And that leads us nicely on to this idea of sacrifice, to this idea of struggle in Islam, because jihad is our next key topic. And the word jihad means to struggle. And again, as with everything we've talked about, it is rooted in the Quran. It describes the personal struggle of Muslims to follow the teachings of Islam and obey God. And again, that struggle Ibrahim must have felt when he was on the mountain, ready to sacrifice his own son out of submission to God because of his faith. So there are two contrasting different understandings of jihad that we need to know. We need to know about greater jihad and we need to know about lesser jihad. Be ready with your AO2 ideas in terms of evaluating the two, comparing the two and asking which one might be more important for Muslims. So what are they? Well, on the one hand, we've got greater jihad, and this means inner struggle. And this is the duty of every Muslim to live a good life, be faithful and obey the commands of Islam. And this is absolutely a struggle. It is difficult. You have to be disciplined. You have to be committed. You know, praying five times a day, for example, it requires a certain level of discipline, of commitment. And that's why we would see it as a struggle. There's going to be a lot of temptation, hence the fact that you stone the pillars that represent the devil on Hajj. You are in this battle, this cosmic battle between good and evil. And it's this idea you must keep struggling, you must keep 
fighting to remain focused and committed to God, resisting sin, resisting the temptation to sin, keeping your body and your mind focused on God, on submission to God, which is, of course, what Islam means. Um, and this means you will follow the five pillars, you will work for social justice, you will study the Quran, you will perform good deeds, you will attend mosque regularly, and you will, really importantly, resist temptation, greed, and envy. So greater jihad is all about the individual struggle, the individual's commitment to their faith and to following the teachings of Islam. On the other hand, then you have lesser jihad, which is military struggle. So greater jihad, inner struggle. On the other hand, you have lesser jihad, military struggle. This is carried out according to strict rules for the purpose of defending Islam. So this is when it becomes a physical struggle. It's when it becomes actual conflict. And lesser jihad may take place in these certain circumstances. When you are fighting for a just cause, so you are fighting to defend the faith, it is when it is a last resort, so you've tried everything else, nothing else works, this is all you've got left. This is the only option you have to defend Islam. It is authorized by an accepted Muslim authority. It ensures that the minimum amount of suffering is caused. So for example, innocent civilians are not attacked. It will end when the enemy surrenders. So again, ensuring minimum amount of suffering, you're not taking any pleasure in what you're doing. It's out of necessity and it's in the, you know, the least, painful way possible and the aim is to restore peace and freedom so you have to meet this very strict criteria in order to engage in the lesser jihad in the military struggle now significantly Muhammad himself fought in holy wars for the sake of defending his religion and so as we've said many many times if you see Muhammad as a key exemplar as a key role model as the key foundational figure in Islam that would suggest that are certain circumstances for example in order to defend the faith that lesser jihad may be important and it is important based on the teachings of the Quran again the infallible absolute direct word of God Surah 2 says fighting God's cause against those who fight you but do not over overstep the limits a really important quote there God does not love those who overstep the limits so you must fight in God's cause but you mustn't take it too far you must ensure for example that it ends when the enemy surrenders um, and that it is fought for a just cause as a last resort Surah 22 says those who have been attacked are permitted to take up arms because they have been wronged God has the power to help them so if you are attacked you are absolutely permitted to take up arms and defend the faith, for example, and God will help you to do that. So showing it is religiously sanctioned. Uh, and then Surah 2 again says, if they do fight, you kill them. This is what such disbelievers deserve. But if they stop, then God is forgiving and merciful. So again, linking back to where we started today's session, when we were speaking about God being merciful, the giver of mercy fight them until there is no more persecution so it will end when the enemy surrenders and worship is devoted to God so this really really clear idea and we really need to get our heads around it that you can engage in military struggle but for very specific reasons and in a very specific way and there is a very strict code of conduct there are very strict rules about this and it's all about defending the religion but not overstepping the limits so you could be asked, in terms of applying this to the exam then, you could be asked, which is the most important for a Muslim? Can you explain and justify your answer? So here's a couple of ideas I came up with, a couple of bullet points, excuse me, I'm now knocking over the flipping table. Apologies, getting very excited. A couple of points that you could um, include that I thought of. So both of them are found in the Quran, which is considered by Muslims, as we know, to be the infallible, complete word of God. If it's in the Quran, it's a direction from God. It's a directive from the divine. So it must be followed and it must be correct. Most Muslims agree that greater jihad is the most important as it is stressed in the Quran. So that inner struggle, your commitment to following the five pillars, for example, and of doing good deeds. Greater jihad is a personal battle 
which is understood by many to be the true meaning of the term um, jihad, this idea of Islam meaning submission, and that does involve a struggle, doesn't it? You have to be disciplined, you have to be committed, you have to persevere in terms of practicing that and putting that into action in your life. However, you could add using that key evaluative terminology, there may be occasions when Islam or the name of God is threatened, and so it may be appropriate or seen as necessary to defend Islam. Islam does therefore have set conditions for this, which shows it can happen. So, you know, the lesser jihad is also in the Quran. It also has scriptural foundations and therefore it also has legitimacy for Muslims. So it's all about developing this AO2 way of thinking, about asking which is the most important and looking at both sides of the argument. Okay, let's finish off, shall we, with a look at festivals. So here's what we need to know. First of all, we need to know this is a great opportunity to link back to the beliefs and teaching section. So when we're talking about festivals, we are talking about celebrating key events that have happened, celebrating key beliefs and teachings. So it's a great opportunity when you're asking why are festivals important, as we always ask, because it's a key command word from the exam board, we need to be linking back to our beliefs and teachings. Why are they important? So here's a couple of ideas. Why are festivals important? We're going to look at a couple in a minute. These are just some generic answers. They give a sense of identity and belonging to the religion. You're coming together, you're celebrating, it anchors you in your religion. It allows you to remember past events and important people within the religion. This provides an opportunity to strengthen your faith, to reflect on your faith and to learn about your faith. A great opportunity for education, a great opportunity for growing spiritually, a great opportunity for coming together as a community. As I've put there, it strengthens the Ummah and it unites Muslim communities and families. It gives you a focus point for your faith and it allows you to celebrate your faith, which again, strengthens it. And it strengthens the connections with those in your community who you are celebrating with because everyone is coming together. It connects Muslims with the worldwide community when everybody is celebrating something together. It allows you to share your Islamic beliefs and to focus on them, to mark key events in the Islamic calendar through the year that can create tradition. It builds your sense of identity. It builds structure. It builds routine. Uh, it allows you to express your gratitude for your religion and to God. It allows you to grow closer to God and, of course, to strengthen your beliefs. So very, very important in terms of personally and also socially. So here are some of the key festivals we need to know. Now we've spoken a lot today about Ibrahim and we're going to speak about him one more time because we need to know about Eid al-Adha which is when the festival of sacrifice is celebrated. So this is about, as we know, remembering Ibrahim's willingness to sacrifice his son when God asked him to. It's about submission, it's about faith. This story is found in Surah 37 and it reminds Muslims, as we've said, of the test of faith faced by Ibrahim and how they should apply this to their own lives. So that is where you see faith in action. You take that key teaching from Surah 37 and it's about applying it. It's translating into practice. What does that key teaching mean for how Muslims live in the world today? That idea of faith being put into action. Um, and it also shows them how they should apply it in their own lives. Sorry, I'm repeating myself, as well as the mercy shown by God when he sends the ram to be sacrificed instead. And this signifies as well the end of Hajj. So I've put in red here the really significant bit, which is what it means for Muslims today. So Muslims remember their own willingness to sacrifice anything to God's wishes. This links in with jihad and struggle, and it links in with the key idea of the word Islam meaning submission. They celebrate with the sacrifices of an animal, which is shared among family, friends and the poor. Prayers, cards and presents are given. So that's how the festival actually looks. And it's really important we know what key beliefs and teachings underpin it. We then have Eid al-Fitr, which is a time to celebrate and thank God for his help in getting through the month of fasting, which is mandated by the Quran. 
It begins when the first new moon is seen. It is a reflective time when zakat also becomes due. So linking it in with that earlier practice, one of the five pillars of Islam. The first Eid is believed to have been celebrated by Muhammad. So it commemorates this event in Islamic history, linking back to our key prophet, the seal of the prophets, and the fact that he inaugurated so many of these rituals, traditions, and routines. Homes are decorated. There will be special services and a celebratory meal. So again, Again, when we were saying before about why they're important, it's bringing people together, it's marking key events, it's learning about your religion's history and developing as a result in your commitment to the religion. Ashura then is the 10th day of Muharram, the first month of the Islamic calendar. It's a day of fasting and for Shia Muslims, a day of mourning. It's a day to remember how Noah left the ark and how Moses and the Israelites were saved from the Egyptians. Indeed, Muhammad had observed the Jews fasting to remember Moses saving the Israelites and he adopted this practice. So remember what we were saying, it feels like 10 hours ago when we were talking about beliefs and teachings and the idea of the other prophets and the other holy books. Islam is very conscientious of that earlier religious history and we see that here with Ashura. When we see the fact that Moses um, and Judaism influenced Muhammad, really significant, really important, and adopted this practice. Shia Muslims, and again, another great opportunity to look at that distinction between Sunni and Shia Muslims, also mourn the martyrdom at Kabbalah in 800, 680 CE, excuse me, of Hussein, who was a grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. And again, a great opportunity to remember that Shia Islam has this real focus on descendancy. He was a grandson of the Prophet, which is why they are mourning his death, that idea of descendancy, of it being hereditary, of a bloodline, really important. Keep making those connections, keep making those links. And so they may wear black as a sign of mourning. So here's a nice little quote as well for you from the surahs. So surah two tells us this, it was in the month of Ramadan that the Quran was revealed as guidance for mankind. So any one of you who is present that month should fast. So really significant there, marking the end of Ramadan because of its significance in Islamic history, because of its spiritual significance and importance and telling you what to do. The Quran as the foundation for not only the beliefs and teachings, but also the practices. It is your complete and ultimate guide. You then have Surah 2 again saying, oh, you who have believed, decreed upon you is fasting as it was decreed upon those before you that you may become righteous. So showing the impacts of fasting fasting and the importance of fasting, but really significant, it was decreed upon those before you. This idea of tradition, of following in the footsteps of your fathers, of your forebearers, you follow in the rhythms and routines of the religion, whether that's going to Hajj and, you know, visiting these significant sites, whether that's following the routines for daily prayers, for all of these things in Islam, we have routine, we have ritual, we have this idea of being committed to a certain set of teachings and a certain way of life. And that is ultimately what the practices section is all about, how those beliefs and teachings translate into practice, how you put the commands of the Quran, the directives of the Quran into practice, whether that's giving money with zakat, whether that's going on pilgrimage with Hajj, or whether that is um, that struggle you face with jihad. So that brings to an end our overview for the 2022 exam for GCSE Religious Studies, Islamic Beliefs, Teachings and Practices. Remember, you've got to keep going over your key command words from the exam board. Make sure you know the importance, the impact, the influence of those different beliefs and teachings we've spoken about. Make sure you're ready, not only for AO1 questions on all of these topics, but be prepared for your AO2 questions as well. Be ready to evaluate, be ready to develop and bring in both sides of the argument. Be ready to really think about as I say, both sides of the argument and how you're going to reach your conclusions. In terms of the wider overview, you've got obviously paper one, which we've just looked at here, which is beliefs, teachings and practices for two religions. And then you've got paper two, which is your thematic studies of four religious, philosophical and ethical themes, theme A, relationships and families, theme B, religion and life, for example. And 
Just as important is your spelling punctuation and grammar marks. Do not forget them. Pay close attention to the quality of your written communication. And one of the best ways to do that is to focus on the command words of the question. So make sure you feel confident, make sure you are calm, and make sure you remember you have got this. You are going to do so well. Believe in yourself, be confident, and enjoy it. Now, if you would like to download this PowerPoint without the typos that I have just seen and I am appalled at, you wouldn't get this in the infallible Quran, would you? Um, I'm going to make it available at benwardle.org. I'm going to put the link for you in the description box below. Thank you very much for watching. As I say, very best of luck. Not that you need it. I know you are going to do so, so well. So just believe in yourself, look after yourself, be kind to yourself because you have got this. Very best of luck. Take care and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.